Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 143rd video cast, 133rd podcast for the week ending July 14th, 2022. Uh, we're going to go briefly through the media hits. Then we've got a special segment that I recorded today with Mitch Hawk over at Benzinga. And then we're going to wrap it up with the article of the week, some of the Ask Me Anything questions, and try to roll right through here uh, in the middle of summer. So uh, first off, I'd like to thank Ellie Terrett, Lauren Simonetti, and Liz Clayman for having me on the Clayman Countdown a couple weeks back. We'll cover that. Uh, then I want to take, thank Finley Walker uh, and Lauren Simonetti and Liz Clayman for having me on the Clayman Countdown this week. We're covering because uh, last week was the special interview with Philip Vasiliou of Legatum, who turned uh, the Chandler brothers turned 10 million into 5 billion over 20 years. So if you didn't catch that last week, we'll show you where to uh, listen to it this week. Uh, then I want to thank um, Alicia Nieves, Ali Thompson, and Rachel Maiman for having me on Cheddar News earlier in the week to talk GameStop. Uh, that was fun. And then uh, public.com, I want to thank Mitch, I want to thank uh, Mike Teak and Ann Berry. That was a great segment as well. And then moving right along to the articles, Ruth Carson uh, included me in her article in Bloomberg on the US dollar today for everyone thinks that the dollar is going to the moon. We're going to take the other side. Just remember guys, when everyone was tripping over themselves for oil and I said the trap door was going to open and now many of those stocks are down 40% now, uh, same thing's going to happen with the U.S. dollar and you can read Ruth's article here. So thanks for including me in that. Uh, thanks to Bansari Kamdar, Noor, Zainab, Hussein, Niket, Nishant, Sumyad, Sumyadev, Chak, Roberti, and David Henry for including me in their article on Reuters. Uh, this was bank earnings as uh, right when JP Morgan came out. I said, as uh, as far as things you don't want to see, you pretty much got every one of them. Uh, missed on the top and bottom line, guidance, cutting buybacks. The buybacks, though, uh, as you'll hear in the segment we're going to cover, uh, are not because JP Morgan is cutting buybacks. It's because of their capital requirements. And he was quite angry at the bank regulators uh, for making him do that. Uh, but I guess it's out of uh, an abundance of caution. Uh, they also increased credit reserves. So just like when we were buying banks and we said they're going to release credit reserves, they're now increasing credit reserves. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, tough start to the morning. I uh, want to thank um, Ellen Chang for including me in, in her article on uh, semiconductors where I touched on uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, which, by the way, uh, beat on the top line, bottom line, and guidance today. Uh, why? Because of se auto semiconductor chips. So while the phones and the computers and the appliances and the electronics are slowing, guess what they're able to uh, kick up the production of and that's driving their earnings is auto chips. They are going to fly and that's going to help uh, one of our uh, key positions, uh, which is uh, Cooper Standard which uh, obviously has been trading down with all the recession fears and um, and mostly more than anything else is credit markets are closed at the moment. Our bet is that they're going to reopen uh, in the next six months as some of these things um, uh, peak. OK, and uh, that's a, another key component that we covered in this segment. We're going to roll right into here uh, with Mitch uh, is that, uh, you know, uh, consumer sentiment and inflation are tied at the hips uh, when you've got an all-time low the last three times since 1980 uh, in sentiment it's usually correlated with the peak in inflation and we're at the same point right now and we'll discuss the implications there so thanks to Ellen Chang for putting me in the street.com on that one want to thank Sagarika Jasnani Jess Sagarika Jaisingani, Jess Menton, Kat Van Hoof for including me in their Bloomberg article. They were asking uh, whether companies would have to cut, cut guidance going into earnings season and um, if they were going to kitchen sink the quarter. 
And I said, you know, if it was going to be a kitchen sink a quarter, like you saw in fourth quarter of 2008, you would have seen a lot more negative pre-announcements. You know, I discussed this with um, with uh, Presley, who helps me with a lot of clips and everything. And I said, look, would you rather sell 10 hamburgers at $10 or eight hamburgers at $15? And um, and that's what's happening. So while the economic activity is slowing and you're seeing less units of items, uh, the nominal inflation is passing through. So for everyone looking at for huge cuts in earnings, you know, next year is at 249, 250. Um, we've already had an 8% cut because earnings have been stable at 250, but inflation's up 8%. So it's basically like in real terms, $230 of earnings and people just aren't accustomed to this high inflation environment and they can't figure out why earnings aren't be cutting, being cut more aggressively, more quickly. They are in real terms, but in nominal terms, they're going to stay up. So even if units are declining and the overall cost is going up. So um, that helped him understand it. I hope it helps you understand it. But if you don't see huge cuts, they're happening kind of under the surface in real terms. It's just not reflected in the number. And that's why we've said earnings are probably going to hold up better than people are expecting because in real terms, they're at 230. In nominal terms, they're at 250, uh, uh, as, as we've stated. So uh, hope that helps. want to thank uh, Amruta Kandekar and Bansari Mayar Kamdar for including me in their article. Uh, Last week, this was be, before the jobs report and basically about uh, the jobs report being strong takes a Fed pivot off the table in, in July for sure. And the CPI and PPI numbers did as well. But I think when you listen to this segment with Mitch, you're going to see, uh, yeah, it's horrible train wreck news this morning. And there's a, there's a big silver lining. Uh, so we'll get right to it in a second here. And then finally, Ellen Chang, want to include her. Uh, thank her for including me also in the street.com. This was about um, uh, why Buffett was um, investing in energy companies when historically he had made fun of energy companies or, or, or avoided investing in commodity companies historically. So what's the difference this time? For those of you who missed the great interview with uh, uh Chris Chandler's Legatum CIO and partner, Philip Basiliou. Uh, you definitely want to check it out. These brothers turned 10 million into 5 billion in 20 years. This is a great interview. We've got so much positive feedback. And this article right here goes into the detail. There's an art article linked to the Macro Ops original article and the uh, um, Institutional Investor original article about how they did that. And then we go deeply into the philosophy with Philip. You're going to learn a ton listening to that. Uh, so with that said, we're going to move right into this segment because everything I wanted to cover on this call, Mitch asked me. And in a 20 minute segment, you'll get all the latest current things from what Fed Waller said midday that caused the market to turn around here. We discussed it in real time. I was on with him at 110 when the market was at the lows. And now it looks like uh, the markets maybe have a decent shot of closing, closing cl close to positive uh, uh, off of that. Uh, we also discussed uh, all the inflation numbers, the positive implications, the negative implications, the tie to sentiment, um, uh, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, the banks, everything that you're wondering about today that has your head spinning that we were going to cover, he covered. So it's, uh, it's right, right coming now. I'll be back at the end to uh, go through the article of the week, the most important developments in our core positions, and uh, a lot of positive things happening in earnings by sector. So uh, see you in 20. All right, let's go ahead. Let's bring on Thomas Hayes here, chairman and managing member of Great Hill Capital Management. Welcome back, Thomas. Hey, Mitch. Great to be with you again. Definitely. Now, of course, we've had some recent economic data. So uh, CPI and PPI hitting the tape since you have been on. So what caught your attention in these reports? Well, the bad news, Mitch, is it was a complete train wreck. Uh, the good news is that it's backward looking. So 
you know, the numbers really couldn't have been any worse. Uh, they were much higher than uh, expected, both on the CPI, core CPI, PPI, core PPI. Uh, and, you know, what everyone was hoping for is these numbers would come in a little bit lower than expected, confirm that inflation peaked in April and the Fed could pivot in the next month or so. Uh, that's just not happened. You had a strong jobs report. You had uh, higher than expected uh, inflation number uh, in the rearview mirror. Uh, so, uh, so that's the negative. The positive is uh, if you've looked in the month of June, uh, if you've been paying attention, which I know you have, but, but uh, for your audience, uh, all the commodities have completely collapsed. And now that even includes energy and oil uh, down, I think today trading 94, 95, uh, 93 to 95 range on uh, WTI crude. Uh, down from whatever it peaked at 130. Uh, you've got coppers rolled over materially, corn, soybeans, cotton, platinum, cocoa, they've all collapsed. So the question is how long does that need how long does that take to trickle into consumer prices? Uh, and then we're going to start to see these numbers roll over. So it's kind of like we're getting it all at once. Opinion follows trend. Uh, and, and today feels like uh, the culmination. I mean, people couldn't be more negative, uh, rightfully so. You know, this too shall pass. It's not fun to see these numbers come in terribly uh, when, when, you know, you see commodities rolling over. But it just doesn't filter through to the consumer that quickly. We're going to see that in coming months. And I think that this uh, level of despondency is going to flip to euphoria. Now, I have to ask the question, in your opinion, do we get the 100 basis point hike rate? Yeah, I don't think so. I think Waller uh, basically more or less took that off the table today. I think a lot of people were starting to think in that direction after the PPI confirmed the CPI. You know, PPI is supposed to be a leading indicator. Uh, and we saw that trend in recent months, but uh, it, it, it was worse than expected. But uh, Waller said uh, that he did need to see a lot more worse data. And uh, the market uh, looking at 100 basis points may be getting ahead of themselves. Uh, he also said that 75 basis points uh, gets us to neutral in July. So that's a pretty big statement. And I always like to watch what people do versus what they say. I've learned that uh, the older I get, that's a, that's a better indicator. And if you look at the Fed, you know, one thing that uh, very few people are paying attention to, Mitch, uh, is the fact that quantitative tightening uh, last month was supposed to reduce $47.5 billion of liquidity from the market. Uh, they were supposed to do that much in quantitative tightening. They actually only did $7.5 billion, uh, and they were net buyers of treasuries. They actually net bought $3 billion of treasuries. So all of the tightening came in mortgage-backed securities. Uh, and that tells me that uh, the Fed sees these trends. They see what's happening with the, the beige book yesterday. You saw economic uh, growth slowing in certain regions. So they're trying to thread a needle here. They know they've seen what's happened to commodities. They've been successful with reducing demand. They can't print more oil. So their only play in their book was destroy demand. They've been successful in doing that. We saw that j just recently in the last, depending on the commodity, four to eight to 12 weeks uh, with, with the collapse in demand there. So uh, I think what they're trying to do is stay accommodative by not doing too much quantitative tightening, but present this image of being very tough on inflation until inflation falls over by itself. And the way that they'll do that is continue to jawbone, but probably only do 75 bips this month. And then if those uh, commodity prices start to trickle into CPI next month, then they'll have an excuse to maybe go 50 in September uh, but if they don't, then they'll have to go 75 again, and, and uh, they're going to remain data dependent. I do like the fact that they're not uh, doing emotional knee-jerk reactions to the data, that they're trying to be measured, but they're trying, you know, it's, it's a juggling act. You know, they, they could be forceful and put us into a depression, uh, but th they're trying to crush demand and try to have the land be landing be as soft as possible, and they're, they're balancing between less quantitative tightening, but keeping the hikes going uh, and hoping that, that these numbers can catch up. And I think when they do catch up, Mitch, uh, they're going to catch up all at once. Just like it seems like today, every single number under the sun is horrible. Uh, uh, I think we're going to get the, the, to the other side of that. It's the question, is it next month? 
or is it two months from now? So how much longer do we have to go through this malaise and uh, you know just basically burning time waiting waiting for things to bottom out and and for the numbers to get better? Well, it sounds like the sun is on the horizon there, but we got to continue to watch what goes on. I like how you stated there about the asset sell off because I think that's so important. Everyone talks about interest rates, but we have to be paying attention how that really is happening there. So I'll call it a little bit of quantitative tightening with a little bit of a band aid on it because it doesn't seem like they're going full steam ahead, at least on the asset sell off. Correct. All right, let's dive into the next area is, of course, is everyone wants to know where are their opportunities in this market? Where do you see some opportunities, Thomas? Well, uh, you know, what, one positive data point that came out this morning, uh, which you touched on, was the Taiwan Semiconductor. So you saw the banks, you know, uh, basically miss on the top line, bottom line, JP Morgan uh, 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 cut off the share repurchases, not at their own behest, actually, because of uh, what what JP Morgan, or what Jamie Dimon says was capricious rules, uh, uh, banking regulatory rules that they have to have X, X, Y, Z capital and the rules are, are uh, fickle. So he wasn't happy about it. It was reported as if he made the decision to do that. They were forced into that decision. But, uh, you know, that's a very interesting business because it's all the investment banking that really hurt them materially. And just as quickly as that turns off and credit markets are currently closed, that can turn on in a heartbeat. It's just, you know, what, we, what we've been getting is bad news after bad news after bad news. No one is set up or positioned right now for unexpected positive news. You could get a geopolitical headline tomorrow. You could get, uh, you know, inflation next month. You could get earnings like Taiwan Semiconductor. And the reason Taiwan Semiconductor is so important is because they're the largest producer of chips for the automotive sector. And the automotive sector is a material impact in CPI numbers. So, um, you know, car, used car prices and new car prices have been very high because there's no supply. The reason there was no supply is because there were no chips. What Taiwan Semiconductor is saying with their earnings is we're producing chips like crazy again. Uh, we're, we're actually seeing build in cons customers' inventories, like all the phone companies that double order chips when there was a shortage, all the electronics companies, appliance companies. But now, uh, because of that, because those customers have uh, excess inventory, they're focused on banging out those auto chips. And, and it, as they get those auto chips out, you're going to see a glut of new cars come on the market, which is going to be really, really positive because it's going to collapse used car prices. And it's also going to bring down new car prices. And that's a big deal. You couple that with all the inventories and the big box retailers that you're going to start to see big discounts going into uh, back to school because they had the wrong inventory, overordered from COVID, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, big discounts there. All of those factors are disinflationary. So just as we're seeing like it can't get any worse with inflation, we're going to see you know drops in certain areas that are going to come all at once. We just don't know if it's two months from now, if it's three months from now, if it's one month from now, or if it's four months from now, but they are coming. Those disinflationary factors are coming. But what do we want to focus on in a slower or slowing growth environment? And the end, because that, that the Fed had to do that to bring down demand, which we're seeing that the results of that. Um, the one area in, idiosyncratically that we like that we've talked to you about uh, in past appearances is biotech. And the reason that we love biotech uh, it's twofold. Number one, on every metric, it's trading at multi-decade lows, uh, whether it's uh, uh, price to operating cash flow, price to book, price to cash, et cetera, et cetera. But more than that, the, our two catalysts are, are coming to bear now. So the sector, if you look at the XBI, for instance, is now up some 32% since we last talked since the May lows. Uh, and, uh, and I think there's a lot more juice in that tank and gas in that tank. Uh, and that is uh, catalyst number one was, um, well, if these companies are so cheap, why aren't big pharma buying them? Well, that started to happen in the last six weeks. You've seen more than a half dozen multi-billion dollar deals uh, of big pharma taking out uh, undervalued biotech with the largest one being just about a week and a half ago with CGen, the $40 billion takeout. Uh, it started with uh, Pfizer taking out Biohaven for 11 billion. So now animal spirits are on. Big Pharma has patent cliffs. They've got a ton of cash. They have to buy that in innovation to grow. And they, can, and they wanna buy it now, one, because they're cheap, but two, is because their competitors have started moving and they know if they don't take advantage of it, their competitors are gonna do that. So that's number one. Number two, 
the FDA has been focused for the last two years exclusively on COVID, getting uh, antivirals, getting vaccines approved and, and safety and all that. So they haven't been focused on approving drugs in phase one and phase two and phase three trials. There are quite a number of drugs now that are up for major uh, milestones, phase two, phase three milestones. We're going to start to see those come out now that the FDA is back to its normalized schedule of looking after regular drugs and approving or disproving them. And as we start to see uh, the deal flow going, coupled with new drugs getting approved, uh, you're going to see huge animal spirits. And the final thing about biotech is everyone says, well, how could you buy biotech in a rising rate environment? Well, the last time we had a rising rate environment was 2016 to 2018. The Fed raised uh, the Fed funds rate from 25 basis points to 250. Biotech went up 140 percent over that period of rising rates. The, the, the group crashed in anticipation of the rising rates down over 50 percent uh, in 2015 to early 2016, just like the sector crashed uh, in the last year from early 2021. Uh, until recently over 60% and now up 30 some odd percent off the lows. We think it's just the beginning and we do think this could be another 100 to 140% move like we saw over a two to three year period, the last uh, Fed tightening cycle. So we think all the components are coming together and, uh, and we like that because we don't have to be waking up every morning wondering what the S&P futures are doing uh, because the, the correlation you've seen on a lot of weekdays Red days for the S&P, biotech has actually been up on quite a few of those in the last month. Uh, to a lesser extent, same with China Tech. China Tech is down in the last week because they had shutdowns again. You're going to see more and more of that, but the direction is up. China, China bottomed in March, biotech bottomed in May, and both have been on an uptrend. Uh, uh, it, while, while the general market has been weak, they've been moving up. And, uh, and we like both of those groups. There's an exceptional amount of stimulus now focused in China. Uh, and as they get through these short-term shutdowns, you're going to see, see money uh, continue to flow back in that direction. Excellent opportunity to keep your eyes on now. Of course, we have a big situation right now with natural gas in Germany and Russia. How do you see this situation playing out? Yeah, I mean, look, the one. Europeans have... Yeah, the Europeans have boxed themselves in this situation. Yeah. So Putin can do basically whatever he wants. I mean, he's got uh, unlimited amounts of funds coming in from China and India are happy to take his uh, oil barrels off his hands uh, at discounted price. He's happy to supply them. So uh, you're not going to drown them out financially. So th now you're seeing Brussels saying, hey, Germany, like you put yourself in this situation. Why should the whole continent suffer? like get over it and, uh, and start to accept that, that supply again. And you saw today, all of a sudden, the servicing of the Nord Stream was fixed. <laughs> Russia said, oh yeah, we're done with the servicing and the, and the energy started to flow again. So I think they're gonna just have to take it the same way China and India is taking it, or they're gonna be uh, losing power. I mean, you're, you're seeing it with, uh, in, in the UK, people, the number one way to get booted out of office is have high energy and high food prices. And you see it, in consumer sentiment in the U.S., by the way, what's really interesting about consumer sentiment in the U.S. is now at 50. Since 1980, uh, it's gotten below 58 three times. In all three instances, it marked the lows in sentiment and the highs in inflation. They were all peaks in inflation. There's an inverse correlation. When, sent when inflation is at its highest, sentiment is at its lowest. It's now at its lowest uh, in over 40 years, which means inflation's uh, at its highest in over 40 years. But here's what happened to the S&P in all of those instances 12 months later. On average, the S&P was up almost 21%. So I know things look a little uh, dim right now, but whether it's uh, days or weeks or a couple more months, we got to wade through the malaise. There are things to do like we discussed uh, before the general market kind of steadies and, and starts to move back up. Uh, but but there are certainly opportunities, and uh, and this level of pessimism is usually accompanied by great opportunity. If you just have to take a little longer view, if you're taking a 60 minute view, it's going to be tough. But if you take you know a six month view, nine month view, uh, this is when money is made. When when no one wants to step in and buy high quality businesses on sale, and you slowly ease in over time, I think you're going to be very happy when you look a year out.
All right, guys, we have Thomas Hayes here, chairman and managing member at Great Capitol Hill. I appreciate you continuing to go here. Uh, we're, we've been on since 1.15. I want to tell the chat, definitely smash it on up if you guys are enjoying the information. I got one more, so I've been enjoying the overtime. Let's do, where do you think oil prices finally get some stabilization? Because we've been seeing <laughs> energy continue down, but I mean, well, where does the stabilization come in? Oh my goodness. So, so, so I, you know, <laughs> I've been calling, I, it's interesting. So we were aggressively buying energy and energy companies in 2020 when no one wanted it, when energy was on the lows. And then we were selling it early this year uh, into the war strength and the strength continued. Uh, and, and we said, look, there's, it's only a matter of time. The trap door is going to open. All the people that hated energy and energy stocks in 2020 now love them and can't buy enough. And sure enough, they opened the trap door in June and collapsed. You know, some of these names are down 30 percent, 40 percent, oils down, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, uh, I, I think you want to see a little bit more pain and really punish those people that came in late. I mean, that's just the way the market works. Uh, it's not personal. But, um, you know, the key is when if you're chasing things when everyone wants it, you're going to get punished. And if you're buying high quality things when no one wants them, you're going to make a lot of money. So as provided you have patience. So I think there's got to be a little bit more pain here, because if you had talked to people three weeks ago about energy, they would say we're going. To, you, you saw the notes. Three hundred eighty six dollars. I think J.P. Morgan put out a note that it was going to three hundred eighty six dollars or some ridiculous thing like that. So, look. I just look at the data, you know, number one, uh, we're not that, that, that production now is not really offline because uh, Russia is pumping like crazy and selling it to China and to India. They're selling it at lower prices, but they're selling it. So that production is, is full tilt. Then you've got uh, the United States, the rig counts up, uh, you know, up uh, now materially from the lows is at 240 something and it's now at 750. And uh, that's down from the pre-pandemic lows of 790, and it probably goes up this week. So we're, we're just about nearing the pre-pandemic highs in terms of rig count. So we're going to have all the U.S. production come back online. We're going to have the Russian production is there. Now you've got uh, President Biden going hat in hand to MBS, please pump more oil. Uh, so maybe he'll get a few barrels there, despite the fact that MBS has a close relationship with Russia. Uh, you may see some there. And then guess where he wants to go after uh, he gets the job, gets a deal done with MBS, is he wants to open the spigots from Iran once again. So it seems like uh, this administration wants to get oil uh, from everywhere else except under their own feet at home. Uh, but, uh, but slowly that production's coming back on. Why? Because not all of the uh, oil assets are owned by public companies. A lot of private equity groups bought that stuff in the hole in 2020 and even 2016 to 2020 when public companies were divesting and the ESG movement was basically uh, cutting off their financing it and making, making it hard for them to uh, get financing to, to drill and to expand. But the private equity companies don't have that constraint and they can pump all day long and at uh, whether it's eighty dollars, ninety dollars, one hundred, ten dollars, you can be assured they're doing it and they're pumping all that cash out of the ground. So uh, that production is going to catch up, uh, and um, and I think we're 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 going to see the Johnny Come Latelys get a little bit more punishment. And then when we look out three to five years, I think the demand is still material. I do think there has been underinvestment, and I think later in this year there's going to be some opportunity to to reload on on energy. But I, I think it's too early right now. Expect more pain. Definitely right or, now. Or that's... pleasure. Or pleasure if you're looking at the CPI numbers. We need right? that sucker I mean, down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it, it's, it's a two-sided coin there. That's for yeah. sure. Um, and, and people at the pumps, I don't think will be too upset if energy continues to come on down. Um, we'll yeah. see what happens and how long it takes to actually show up at the pumps, which is the important part too. Um, yeah. But like always, thank you for coming on today. Thomas Hayes, Chairman and Managing Member at Great Hill Capital Management. Definitely, I've heard in the chat, he's a great follow. I would say so myself also. Thank you for coming on, Thomas. Okay, welcome back. I want to cover this tweet from Seth Golden. I referenced this with, uh, with Mitch in the interview you just listened to. And um, he said, rarely does University of Michigan consumer sentiment drop below 56 like it did in June when it has 
It always marked the lows in sentiment and the peak in inflation. And here's the data. I believe this is from, he took this from Sentiment Trader. Uh, yeah, Sentiment Trader. So uh, this shows you one year later on average every time consumer confidence got this low, it coincided with peak inflation and the S&P on average was up 20.87% 12 months later. Also want to show you, um, just to give you guys a long-term view of some of the things I look at. So, you know, XBI is now up from 61 to 80 and change, about uh, just over 30%. Um, but, you know, when fundamentals either take time to manifest or don't make sense in the short term or you're in a weird market, it always makes sense to kind of look at the long-term fundamentals. And this is a monthly chart. We've talked about this in the past, just kind of zooming out. And you can see that, you know, history is repeating here. You get the, to these extreme levels on simple indicators. And when they start to curl up, you know, your bottom's in. It's not overnight, but this is the beginning of big moves. This is the move through the last tightening cycle that I talked about with Mitch. It crashed 50% uh, and then it rose 140%. Same thing here, it crashed 60 plus percent. And now we're starting to make our recovery. But, you know, this was a two-year move, 140%. Same thing here in 2018, two year move. So we expect this to be a two year move and this can be big time. Now let's take a look at Baba. Okay, Baba's had a tough week, why? Uh, two things, one was uh, new shutdowns in uh, Macau for this week. So by Monday they should be open again. Fear of more shutdowns in China. As I said, this is gonna be fits and starts, fits and starts, there's no way around it. But the key is they're continuing to pour the stimulus. Um, so let's just take a look at BABA on a long-term view. And you can see here, it's been a messy putting in the bottom, just like it was back in 2015. You get these spike ups, you get these fake outs to take the late money that jumped in here, take their, uh, rip their faces off, and then you rip high. You know, and then these people jump in here, rip their faces off, and then you jam it up to new highs. Same thing here. Everyone jumps in here, rip their faces off, jam it up to new highs. So, you know, we probably shoot back up here, maybe to 140 plus, and then they'll do a rip your face off like they did here, and a rip your face off like they did here, then jam it up, rip your face off, jam it up, jam it up, rip your face off. But you can see that the key indicators are now turning up. And that's the name of the game is the key that I always say is direction. Um, and don't worry about these fits and starts and this, this short-term craziness because this is what we want to catch over two years. This is what we want to catch over two years. And that's where we make fortunes. And that's where you make the big money. If you can stay through this and this and this. Uh, same thing with uh, XBI. You know, uh, this was not pleasant. You know, you had this, you know, all this maybe caught the bottom and then it started to go and boom you know six months later you had this huge drop back down from 68 to 52. same thing here maybe you caught the bottom and then you were sideways for a while and then you got shaken out look at this move here that took everyone out of their positions and then boom the biggest move they jammed it right up so i think we're probably right around here just like here and then you know it'll be a uh, sideways thing for two years up 140 percent and we'll make a fortune but again, you can see these major indicators turning up, turning up, turning up, and that's what we want to see. Uh, even CPS, which is a more high risk, high reward, could be a donut hole, but we like the risk reward. We think credit markets will reopen before the end of the year. It will follow equities. It will follow sentiment. Um, it will follow peak inflation. It will follow all those things. Uh, but take a look at during the pandemic, they dropped down huge. Uh, and then it took one, two, three, four, five months to build the bottom. We're only on month three here. Then they shot up. Everyone chased up at $20. And then they ripped their faces off, took it back down to $10 before jamming it up to $47. So um, here, you know, we're month three. We can have two more months of bullshit, excuse my language, uh, until they get financing. Probably three or four months before they get financing. And then you'll get a shoot up probably to 20 bucks. And then we'll start to see the chips come in. We'll start to see them 
uh, sell to the OEMs, and then we start to move towards that goal of normalized, you know, 300, 350 million dollars of EBITDA, nine million, nine dollars a share in earnings, 10 to 20 times multiple, and this could be a huge, huge thing. But again, you could manage your risk by sizing because it could be a donut hole if they don't get financed. But you see this. Um, this is normal. So if you look at day to day, you get faked out of your position. If you look at, you know, this took one. So this was like that would be like that one, two, three, another four or five months before it just shot up. And by the way, what's interesting about this, this was after the pandemic. That next quarter, before the chip shortage started, they did 30 to $40 million of EBITDA, and then they ran out of chips, and that was it. Once the OEMs ran out of chips, they weren't selling to the OEMs. Uh, now the chips are coming back, and we're going to look at some of the Taiwan semiconductors. So, you know, you could get the financing and the chips happening all at once, and this thing could rock it. So, but again, you step back from the day to day, you can see, you know, these, uh, uh, um, I would, uh, the chief technicians, they call it uh, divergence, where the price is going down, but these are going down less, and therefore it should indicate a reversal and all that stuff. I mean, all that stuff is helpful. But at the end of the day, you have to know what you own so you can deal through this, and you can deal through this because this is going to come by the way whether we're here and we're going to run up and then check out here or we're here and we're going to run up and check out here or we're here and we're going to go back down one more time like they did here and here and that's when everyone's going to get taken out and then boom and then you get the, these monster moves like you got these two times uh i don't know my my instinct is we're probably closer to like here you know uh, we probably dealt with this because you had these kind of double bottoms here. Um, but again, this has nothing to do with our thesis. I'm just kind of giving you a visual to get you through the emotional periods so they don't rob your, rob your ownership from you, which is what happens and why most people never make huge money in the stock market is because they get taken out at the exact wrong time. Uh, when stocks are attractive, you buy them. This is from Peter Lynch. Sure, they can go lower. I bought stocks that at $12 that went to $2.00. But then they later went to $30. You just don't know when you can find the bottom, Peter Lynch. But he knew what he owned, and that's what made him one of the best. Bruce Lee, patience is not passive. On the contrary, it is concentrated strength. Uh, this is the Secrets of Sovereign article that covered the story of Richard and Christopher Chandler's move from $10 million to $5 billion in two decades, investment by investment. You definitely want to cover that for background. We also covered it in the article of the week last week. That's where you can also find the interview with Philip. Check that out. It's worth listening to a few times. He dropped a bunch of gems in there. Uh, NASDAQ just turned positive into the close after a 600-point down day. And remember, I said this uh, could be a sell the rumor, buy the news instance. And, uh, and that's what it looks like it's turning out to be. Uh, we'll see if we get some follow-through next week. But um, I, like, I like the way this is working out. Uh, Tom Lee, the stock market is gearing up for a strong recovery in the second half as transitory inflation begins to cool. We agree. It's a minority view, but I'm telling you, when we look at some of the commodity charts, you're going to see, and, if, and just listening to Mitch, how it works on a lag basis till the consumer finally sees it. Iran nuclear talks likely to resume after Biden's Gulf trip. So if he gets a deal with MBS, he's going right to Iran. So we could see a lot of supply quickly. And that trap door that opened in June, uh, they're going to go down a lot more uh, levels than they think the Johnny come lately that crammed in in early June uh, when we were saying watch out for the trap door uh, it's going to be like the Tower of Terror at Disney's um, uh, Disney's they got three parks the one with the movies uh, that's a great ride by the way if you've got young kids it's like this haunted hotel you go in this elevator that looks outside and they literally drop you three floors bounce you back up that's what's going to happen with these energy people the Tower of Terror uh, Boeing gets good news. Rolls-Royce sees demands for big jets returning. That's been a theme. Obviously, uh, Boeing's mismanagement has hurt in the short term, but in the long term, the thesis is well intact. Uh, we also like Rolls-Royce. That's a different special situation that we haven't spent a lot of time on, and we're not going to do your own homework on that one, but uh, worth taking a look at. Uh, along the lines with the uh, biotech deals that we've been covering, obviously the CGen was the big one last week for $40 billion. Another one got done, Meridian Bioscience, $1.5 Animal Spirits are on. 
Uh, Biotech's now opinion follows trend with them up 30 some odd percent off the bottom. Biotech's uh, stocks are poised to outperform for the rest of 2022. Do you have Biotech FOMO? It might be time to pay attention to these names. Uh, get ready for a summer of sales as prices for everything from department store goods to high-end watches gets deeply discounted as inventory stacks up. This is disinflationary, which we covered with Mitch. Uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Tops Earnings. Demand for cars helped. The demand for cars is a two-year backlog. It's demand from OEMs for the chips that are finally getting produced that is helping Taiwan Semiconductor. They can actually, now that the electronics and the appliance demand is cooled, uh, they can uh, get the chips out and they're starting to in mass and that's going to help our Cooper Standard. That's the linchpin for the Cooper Standard. Two catalysts. Uh, and that's what I always say with these things. You've got to have catalysts. With BABA, it was very simple. It was the China tech crackdown had to reverse, which it did in March. Eventually, the pain got acute enough for the government that they flipped. Once they started laying off 20% of their population, their workforce, uh, politicians' number one job is to stay in power, and that's what happened. So uh, not too late to chase Chinese stocks still near the bottom for Credit Suisse. Again, opinion follows trend. China's economy returns to growth mode as COVID-19 lockdowns lift. So this was probably from last week. Uh, so now this week you had the fear. Again, it's going to be fits and starts. The key is direction. BlackRock's China ETF lures record cash amid world-beating rally. Okay, again, um, Taiwan Semiconductor sales soar 44% in another sign of resilient tech demand. Now that's auto chip demand. Uh, Biden might soon ease Chinese tariffs in a decision fraught with policy tensions. So that'll probably be next after he does the oil thing. Uh, Alibaba to test self-driving trucks on public roads without human safety drivers. This is big. Alibaba is going into all the areas that the government wants them to go into, like a disruptive tech, like uh, autonomous trucks, like um, uh, this agricultural stuff that Jack Ma is now doing with the government. So things are on good terms. China ETFs attract billions as investors hope sell-off is over. Chinese gaming stocks jump after Beijing approves new titles and assigns scrutiny as easing. So look, this is all from the last week and two weeks. This is a whole lot different than the headlines we saw in March, uh, which were a whole different game. And this is the name of the game. Opinion follows trend. I can't emphasize it enough. If you master your emotions, you can make big money in this business with patience and knowing what you own and getting through these periods where you get excited. Uh, and, or let's say you bought here. You thought this was it. Boom, you bought here. They ripped your face off. Then they brought you back in. They ripped your face off. If you held tight knowing what you owned, you were up 300% over the next year and a half. You know, same thing here, 2018, 200% in the next year and a half. But you got to get through this. And this doesn't look like a lot on a monthly chart, which is why I'm showing you the monthly chart. On the daily charts, I'm telling you, this was, you know, a move from 195 to 150 in one month, 25% down. You, you don't think that took people out of their stock, especially when they bought up here after the, sh the first rally? The same thing, just be prepared. Maybe we already had it, maybe more of it's coming. So keep that in mind. And it looks like we just closed with the NASDAQ up after a treacherous morning. So that's another good thing. Um, okay, moving right along. China to set up $75 billion infrastructure fund to reaccelerate uh, economy growth. That was from a week ago. Today, they were talking about a trillion dollars and another fund for $200 billion. So they are going kitchen sink all in. All they got to do is keep the doors open, by the way. If they'd stop closing things down, we'd probably be, Baba would be at 160 right now. But um, so they're doing what they do. But eventually it will break free and, uh, and, and it's going to just be exactly what we saw. History doesn't repeat, but it does run. Why China's stock market looks like it can keep going strong. Okay, this was all, you know, when things are going up. Now they, everyone gets the doubt that my favorite author from Barron's who always writes negative stuff, she was out today. She couldn't help herself. She, it made her so happy to write something negative about China and about Alibaba. So she she was just, uh, this, this is, she's going into the weekend super happy. Uh, China embarks on a state-led search for disruptive innovations as it seeks to take on the lead in tech. And this is going to be the kind of stuff, again, 
Alibaba investing in the metaverse, which the Chinese government wants them to do. So um, now this is key. Remember the rumors last month that the paperwork was being filed and could happen as quickly as July. Um, we'll see, uh, but Alibaba ant listing approval would help China stocks re return to normalty. The same thing that brought them in could bring them out. If they get this thing out before the end of the year, could be before the end of the month, who knows? That would be a, like a quantum leap game changer. You'd see money just start to fly back into China uh, like nobody's business. Alibaba stock back in the groove. Why China tech could keep outperforming. Um, China prepares $220 billion stimulus with tsunami of bond sales. Uh, Brie Biosciences surge after launching China's first domestically developed COVID-19 drug. That could be a game changer, so they stop with all these shutdowns. Alibaba earnings turnaround hopes revived after shares rise 60%. So guess what? The stocks were up, the, the, the shares were up 60% last week off the lows. Everyone got excited. This week, you take out the Johnny Come Latelys, normal shakeout. And then uh, once you get them all out today and tomorrow, then they can take it back up next week. Who knows? Maybe it's the ant filing over the weekend or next weekend. And then boom, everyone that got taken out of their stock again, they missed the huge gap opening and they're, and they're left in the dust. China unveils plans to spur car demand, may extend EV tax break. China considers the, that one we covered. Jack Ma tours Dutch University to learn sustainable agriculture as Alibaba founder keeps a low profile. He is there on behalf of the Chinese government to learn how to grow a ton of food fast so they can feed all their people. That sounds like they're cooperating. He helps the government, the government helps him with the Ant Financial IPO. Buy the dip in China markets despite COVID concerns, says Bank of America Securities. So amazing how quickly trend flips from uninvestable to can't get enough. And now you got all these can't get enough articles last week. What did they do? They took the stuffing out of them this week. And that's exactly what happens. Everyone that bought up at 120, 130, they knock the stuffing out of it, take it down to 105, get them out of the stock, jam it back up. And this just happens over and over and over. And the only way you can know this stuff it's to just be around it for years and years and you recognize the same pattern, the same headlines over and over and over. Um, ah, Chief market strategist at a 1.8 billion firm explains why you should consider buying beaten up Chinese stocks and a risk free inflation uh, protected asset. OK, I bonds as well. Chinese stocks and I bonds. That makes a lot of sense. All right. China's contrasting path offers the potential for uncorrelated returns and they emphasize the green shoots business activity in China appears to be growing again. This is the Caxon China uh, PMI index. Look at this. It went from massive contraction just a few months ago to now massive expansion uh, back above 55. So you can read that article in the Financial Times. Tencent, Alibaba, and DD fined by China antitrust watchdog for unreported merger deals as early as 20, 2011. So people thought that this was honestly the reason why Alibaba was down a couple of days ago. Uh, early in the week because they got fined $75,000 times five instances. So they took $10 billion market cap off the stock for a $300,000 fine and people thought that was the reason. That wasn't the reason. The reason was they shut down the casinos in Macau for a week because they got a COVID or two case and they were worried that that was going to lead to more shutdowns, which it may or may not, but that's just going to be the fits and starts and you have to deal with it. Um, next, China's car sales jump as COVID curbs relax. Shanghai to ramp up support for metaverse development. Again, that benefits Alibaba. Uh, Biden G call likely to take place in coming weeks, says Blinken. So that was uh, four days ago. So after he gets the oil stuff done, he'll be on to uh, getting the China tariffs done. Hong Kong's Paul Chan says China's economy will rebound quickly. This is that major um, uh, private equity executive who was pessimistic just two months ago. So now he's bullish again. Uh, this is Munger's most recent filing. He has kept 20%. Uh, he has kept his position the same. Remember, he went on leverage. The board flipped out. He got off leverage, and he stayed at the exact same size ever since, which is 20% of the uh, Daily Journal's portfolio. Uh, China readies. Uh, this is from from uh, last night. China readies 1.1 trillion U.S. dollars to support Z's infrastructure push. So they, you know, 220 wasn't enough. Now they're at 1.1.
your kitchen sink in this. You're, you're going to see it. I'm telling you that everything we said that was going to happen is now happening. And now you're going to you started to see it in the stock price. You're going to see it in a material way in the stock price uh, as we move forward. China's credit flow jumps as government bond government boosts economic stimulus. So here's the credit expansion. We'll cover some of those economic uh, numbers at the end. OK, this was why it was down today. Alibaba executives called in by China authorities as it investigates historic data heist. So they had a breach of AWS uh, 200. Uh, let's see. Um, a bunch of uh, data on a bunch of Chinese citizens was breached. AWS, uh, not AWS, um, AliCloud was the host. Not good news, okay? But they'll work it out. They'll figure out what happened with the code. They'll fix it. They'll pay a fine on to the next. I mean, you know, shit happens. I mean, on to the next. But this is today's topic du jour. Next week, we could have Ant Financial and the stock's up 40 points. But uh, that's why it is. And, and uh, just, just one last reason to take people out of their stocks at the exact wrong time. Here's the article of the week. As bad as it gets, stock market and sentiment results. In 1997, Jack Nicholson co-starred with Helen Hunt in a movie called As Good As It Gets. When it comes to markets, you want to be a seller when things are as good as it gets. However, it pays to be a buyer when things are as bad as it gets. And the economic data of the last 24 hours, it just seems like everything was as bad as it could get. The CPI was horrible. The PPI was horrible. The uh, JP, the banks were relatively horrible. But if you look under the surface, it's just banking. Uh, the investment banking business uh, went to the woodshed. Uh, it, you know, year on year comps were tough, obviously, free money like crazy last year. But the credit markets are closed right now. So that is what it is. What opinion will follow trend? The equity markets will rebound. No one is positioned for unexpected good news. No one's expecting any good news. It's just bad news after bad news. And what it's telling me today is the, the news can't get any worse and the market just doesn't seem to want to go down. I mean, it's not taking out those lows. Could that change? Yes. Has it changed? No. And I do like this, that there's some bid coming in at this uh, near these lows um, to support the market after horrible, horrible news. So we covered that. The beige book you should read through because it's showing in the Fed's beige book that um, increased risk of recession, signs of slowing demand, which is why you've seen the Fed talk tough. But in the background, they only did seven and a half billion dollars of quantitative tightening last month when they had scheduled forty seven point five billion. So they're talking rates. But in the background, they're being very accommodative with quantitative tightening, i.e. not doing it in any material way as of yet. Um, these were the CPI numbers. You can see that uh, core CPI year on year is the only thing that's looking like peak. You'll start to see more and more headlines emphasizing this as we move closer to the election in November. Uh, headline CPI is bad news. It hasn't peaked yet, but uh, this is backward looking. And that is why we you can see uh, industry by industry. It's all energy, which is rolled over and new and used cars, which I told you why it's going to roll over. The question is timing. Um, but take a look. That's backward looking. What is not yet filtering in that will be soon, and that's commodities. You can see energy. This is from, I guess, a day ago. It's lower than that now. It's got down to 94 or 93, I think, this morning. Natural gas rolling over, cocoa rolling over, cotton rolling over, OJ rolling over, lumber rolling over, platinum rolling over, copper collapsing, corn collapsing, soybeans collapsing, wheat collapsing. These are all foodstuffs. But this all happened in the last 30 days, so it's not going to be felt by the consumer for another couple of months. And that's why the numbers still stink. And that's why the Fed is talking tough and trying to stay somewhat accommodative because they're seeing in the beige book activity slowing down dramatically, even though prices aren't following it quite as quick because of the lagged effect. So patience, Daniel son. It's going to happen. Uh, then uh, I had this uh, segment with um, Alicia about GameStop. Uh, that was a lot of fun. You can read and listen to that on, on your own time. And then this segment with um, with Ann Berry on um, public is definitely worth a listen as well. Sentiment ticked up. Uh, the, the fear is starting to thaw among retail investors, but still at very low levels. Uh, the 
fear and greed is still at extreme fear. These are times where you got paid to buy, not sell. And the National Association of Active Investment Managers, any positive news and managers will have to uh, aggressively chase up. They probably won't believe it at first, which will make the chase even harder. All right, Carter did a bunch of earnings over the last two weeks. Defense and aerospace in the last 60 days, top 30 weights were revised up 57 basis points for next year, up 1.37%. So everyone waiting for these big cuts uh, may be waiting because in, in nominal terms, in real terms, uh, earnings have gone down. In nominal terms, them staying flat, it, it really means the decline. So we covered that, um, but earnings are going up in defense and aerospace. Transports, no one would believe this. Earnings up for this year, 3.42%. Next year, down 2.6%. So you got to go on a, a company by company basis and look through that. Energy. Um, this is yesterday's news, but their earnings were revised up 14% for this year in the last 60 days, 13% for next year in the last 60 days. Retail, everyone hates to death in the last 60 days that top 30 weights earnings revised up 1.08% for this year, uh, 49 basis points for next year. These are the earnings, like I said, Taiwan beat bottom line, top line raised, which is critical, both for tech, but more importantly for uh, auto OEMs, which helps our uh, Cooper Standard. Uh, the banks, again, that's all banking. And just as quickly as that turned down, like I covered with Mitch, that can just reaccelerate overnight when sentiment flips. Uh, economic data, this is the China credit growth. Look at money supply in China. Everyone else is tightening, they're easing. M2 money stock up 11.4% uh, year on year new loans so while our money supply is contracting theirs is expanding aggressively uh new loans 2.8 billion relative to 2.4 expectations 1.9 last print loan growth up 11.2 percent year on year and total chinese total social financing their last print for may was 2.7 billion Last month, they went up to 5.1 billion. They are going to throw the kitchen sink at this to get 5.5% GDP, and we're along for the ride. So I'm excited about that. The CPI, PPI, we, we you know, beat that like a dead horse. Uh, they suck, but they're backward looking. So uh, we've given you all the reasons why on a lag basis they're going to come down. Just like we said the trap door was going to open for energy, the same thing's going to happen for CPI. And uh, commodities are already telling us the story in the futures market. Just wait and see. Um, and that's the story. So uh, tomorrow we'll get some retail sales data, uh, New York State Empire, and we'll see the rig count. Where did the rig count? Uh, where is the rig count? Let's see. Oh, we're going to get consumer sentiment next uh, tomorrow as well. That's going to be a big one. The recount was 752 last week, down from 790 pre-pandemic, up from 750 the week before. Earnings came down a little bit ahead of earnings. They usually do that before every earnings season. So it's 249.83 versus 250. We're still trading below 16 times next year and uh, 229.79. So they've come in a hair, but they're still elevated on a nominal basis. That's all that matters. And that's why we remain sanguine. So we'll take it day by day, week by week. I want to thank you for tuning in this week. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now. Thanks so much, Money Mitch. Appreciate it. All right, let's keep going, guys. You guys got some 